Xbox stands on shaky ground. Lord of the Rings gets a second master. And gaming goes to academia. These stories and many more on this episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. Make some crazy money. What is a man? It's me, Mario. What a mess. Get over here! Please save me. Welcome back to the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine, the show where we travel back in time 40, 30, and 20 years ago to see what was making headlines in the video game and home computer industries. And I'm Carl, and as always, or somewhat always, I'm here with my co-host, Peter. Say hi, Peter. Well, hello there. Hello there. Ooh, now you're trying to get all debonair and suave. <laughs> I wanted to bring in some swag, man. Yeah, nice, nice, you know, make it smooth. Yeah. You should put a little bit of jazz underneath that Dude, or you something. Know- you know, I, I've just recorded the game of today, and I'm feeling so jazzy right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. So, yeah. uh, we are going back today, 20 years into the past, to October of 2001. And uh, we're going to find out what was going on there. But we obviously have to do our little banter. And you know what? I think this was enough banter. Are yeah, we done I with banter? So. Okay, uh, banter's over. But, banter's over. But we're done with banter. We don't need it. Nobody cares yeah. about the banter. Nobody comes here for the banter. Nobody turns the show off as soon as we're done with the banter. So we're just not going to do any banter. You know what we're doing? What are we're we doing? We're putting the banter during the actual recording. So people that come just for us and not for the facts we're providing, they'll have to stay through the entire episode. Ooh, ooh we spread the banter out mm-hmm. for those banter aficionados. Okay. Exactly. Or we just up. scare away. We just scare away the people who desperately don't want the banter. Okay, um, <laughs> yep, and we've lost them as well. So girls are gone. Okay. Mac users are gone. Those guys are gone. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Now, uh, that being said, uh, before we can turn on the time machine, uh, there's a few orders of business, of course. First off, uh, the general pimping of the show remember everybody uh that uh, we are on the patreons and on the social media so uh, follow us all the links are in the show show notes below if you do become a patron patron you will be able to get early access to our interview episodes and we have three really good ones up there right now so go ahead and check that out and beyond that uh yeah uh there's also something else, but we'll talk about that later. And yeah, uh, so let's get going with our first regular segment. So every month or every time jump episode, the co-host must delve into one of the games that was reviewed in a publication dated October of 2001 in a little segment we call The Seven Minutes in Heaven. And as you already alluded to, uh, and breaking the image and uh, mystique of the show, you've already played the game for seven minutes. So uh, we are going to now jump over to Peter, uh, well, after a small musical interlude, as is appropriate, for a little game for the PlayStation, PlayStation 1, by the way, called Sheep Raider. Are you ready, Peter, for the game? I was so ready. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. Okay, let's get going. Welcome back from your seven minutes in heaven, Peter. So, for the uninitiated, explain to us, based on your brief encounter with the game, what is Sheep Raider all about? 
Well, Sheep Raider is a an, an redistribution simulator, I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the NBA so, is coming out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay. So it's a Looney Tunes game, actually, where you play Wily Coyote trying to raid sheep. Um, unsuccessfully, yes, I want to um, take away. I want to say. Um, so well, the game is set up as a giant game show hosted by Duffy Duck. And the aim of the game is to raid sheep, which are herded by, I have no clue how this dog is called. A sheep dog. Sheepdog. It's cool. actually Sam the Sheepdog, and it's not Wiley yeah. Coyote. Okay, um, Wiley think... Coyote looks just like him, but the difference is the nose color. This is Ralph, and he's supposed to be <laughs> okay. a. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's... thanks for clearing this up. I mean, I was so confused about the nose color. <laughs> Okay, so please, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please continue. <laughs> okay. Oh, Lord, no orgasm. Um, so you're basically play, playing Ralph, the coyote, and uh, you're... Uh, he's also uh, not a coyote. I think he's supposed to be a wolf, but yeah, well, let's let's ignore all that. Yeah. <laughs> you're playing a being from <laughs> Looney Tunes being called Ralph. And Ralph is approached by Duffy Duck. Uh, Duffy Duck being a game show host who wants to host the game show, uh, which is about stealing sheep. And this is your mission. So you're basically in a game show walking through different levels that I think as we progress get more and more complicated and you steal sheep. It's a game in a 3D uh, perspective, a third person view, you're right behind Ralph. And you have this level set up where you have platforms to jump on. You have items to use, just like dynamite. You have stuff blocking your way, so like rocks, which you have to blow away by, with the dynamite. And you have this herd of sheep, which is your ultimate goal to get sheep out for off uh, while not being seen by Sam the sheepdog. Okay, and, and sheep is sheep is both singular and plural. So it's not sheeps, it's sheep. I know, it English is, is weird. You said sheeps. Oh. Yeah. Don't worry, you got this. I Keep learned going. so much during this episode. This is so cool. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so you're getting your sheep and try to bring it in a, well, secluded area where they are yours. And as I said, you try not to be seen by the sheepdog. Um, doing so, you meet different characters from the Looney Tunes that for some reason want to help you. I mean, right from the get-go, I walked into a... I have no idea what his name is, but it's a stuttering pig. Porky pig. Porky. Yeah, you know, the thing is, I know them in German, but I don't know their names in English. Um, but you walk into Porky Pig, who um, is not at all afraid by you, but also but even gives you a hint and that lettuce helps luring away sheep and not having to carry them. So, but this is basically it, at least the first couple of minutes. Um, and I want to mention that I continued my tradition of being unsuccessful in the games that you give to me to play. And the game, well, then ended with me being detected by uh, Sam the Sheepdog. We had an epic battle. I mean, it was really <laughs> a close call. You, you couldn't tell um, for quite a while who was uh, having the upper hand. Um, to sum it up, Sam had the upper fist. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the game is a bit of a uh, stealth uh, puzzle yeah. action game. So the levels are basically laid out in such a way that you have to stealthily, you can disguise yourself um, as a bush and stuff to move around. And as long as you're outside the radar view of Sam, which moves around, uh, you can move and uh, have to figure out strategies and build devices or uh, move stuff into the right positions to, in order to be able to get to the sheep. You know, you know. now that we talk about it, why didn't I just use the dynamite and blew up Sam the sheepdog? Yeah, that doesn't work. 
Sam is okay. invulnerable oh. to all that. He's he's like the Sentinel in the game, the Sentinel, which you probably haven't played. But in a couple of years, we will get to the 40th anniversary of that game. And, oh, I will make you play the Sentinel. And you will I'm not have an idea it. what to do. <laughs> but uh, we'll get to that. Some we'll business as that. usual. Okay, <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, okay, yeah. Have you ever seen any of the uh, Sam and Ralph cartoons? No, I have not. No. Ah, oh, oh, then half of this was uh, missed on you. It's basically exactly the game. It's, uh, but it, it's set up always as the cartoon begins with them both showing up to work and clocking in with a punch card. And they're like, hi, Sam. Hi, Ralph. How are the kids? Okay, yeah. And then as the, as the work whistle begins, Sam sits down and begins, you know, his watching and Ralph begins his day of trying to capture the sheep. And then he keeps hmm. beating the crap out of him. And then at the end of the cartoon, the whistle blows again and they clock out and go home. <laughs> okay, it's, got it. Uh, there's like three nice. or four of these. And the reason why Ralph looks just like Wile E. Coyote is that they were also created, I believe, by Chuck Jones, the same creator okay. of uh, – Roadrunner. I'm not sure which series came first. Obviously, Roadrunner was much more popular, got a lot more cartoons, but there's at least three, maybe four of these. Uh, you can find them on YouTube. It's absolutely hilarious. It's almost better than the Roadrunner stuff. Okay. So I do recommend them. And the fact that there's this game, it just is funnier. Now, in the States, it was called Sheep Raider, very much a play on Tomb Raider, which was still big yeah. at the time. And in Europe, the game was called Sheepdog and Wolf. And it may have just been because the cartoons were less well known or they didn't have the Looney Tunes logo on the front. Uh, so just, uh, yeah, I have no idea why they left it out, but, uh, it was, it had a different name in the European release. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember when being a kid that I really adored those Looney Tune cartoons, but they weren't that often shown on the TV. Yeah, uh, I mean, they were very big in the 80s in Germany. I remember seeing them as a kid on vacation. But uh, yeah. yeah, by the time you were a kid, they weren't really shown anymore. There may have been an issue with the violence in them um, being less popular. And uh, just I, there was nobody bringing those cartoons uh, on TV anymore. In the States, they were always a classic. I mean, mm -hmm. growing up, it was there was always a block of it, about an hour of them every Saturday morning. And on local stations, we got them at least once a day at some point in the block. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah, it was it was just always there. And then later on, on Cartoon Network, they were airing them all the time, too. So th those characters and those uh, cartoons are still super popular. And, hmm. uh, yeah, this game was probably at this point, I mean, yeah, there, we also had a couple of games on Game Boy that were quite good, but most Looney Tune based games were pretty mediocre, uh, yeah. all, all the way to terrible. There's a few good ones. The original Roadrunner arcade game is kind of good, even though it's very short, but this was the one that always stood out to me. And I absolutely, I, I absolutely love this game. I played this for forever back in the day. And so that's why I definitely wanted to have it on here, even though of course we're pretty deep into the PS2 era at this point, or at least yeah. a year into the PS2, but still I thought this one was worth uh, going back to. So hmm. would you I mean, recommend I enjoyed this it. game? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, at least of what I, what I saw, I really enjoyed this and I liked the humor, the Davi Dark as being the showmaster and doing his, uh, well, I mean, he had the voice, huh? voice of Davi Dark and the way he's, Book or he speaks mm. in the cartoon. So this was was actually pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. It. And it gets more. It gets really, really difficult in the later levels because it's a lot of minute timing and planning out mm -hmm. a bunch of moves, and uh, it can get a little bit annoying in the later levels because once you screw up, you kind of screw up, and you have to start the whole level from scratch. So ah, okay. the later levels can get really, really tedious. Yeah. Uh, again, if you're playing it on an emulator, you can always use save states, which is <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge, maybe the way I've played it. Uh, then, <laughs> then it becomes much more bearable. But if you're playing it on original yeah. hardware, the lack of those save states are really going to annoy the hell out of you after the shortest period of time. 
Yeah, I think so. So, think okay, so. good. We've got Sheep Raider in the can. Mm-hmm. Before we can uh, turn on the time machine and see what was making headlines in the magazines dated October 2001, remember, that's always the framing device we use here. We also need to remind our listeners that if they want to see you play the game with our commentary, then they have to become Patreon patrons because that video is up exclusively for our patrons and you can become a patron for as low as a dollar a month. So you shouldn't miss it. Yeah, I shouldn't miss it. Okay. And with that being said, let's check in with our good friend Ethan for a little segment we like to call the Department of Corrections. Onto the breach. Once more onto the breach, you dogs of war. Ah, I did. Okay. Welcome back to the Department of Corrections, Ethan. Before you teach me the business end of a correction pen or something, we need to talk about the... Peter Comet! Excellent. Peter is absolutely right about the joys of being in the backseat with a Game Boy. And the fact that you never got to experience this, Carl, means that you are an incomplete human being. (laughs) Ah, you you might be right there. You just might be right. (laughs) So I, I share the solidarity with you, Peter. Though we have never met, and though we are many miles apart... We are of the same experience. Video games have brought us together. Ah, uh, this is true. This is true. It is a common factor between all of us around the world, except for those who have not played them in the backseat of a car on a Game Boy. Of course, uh, I I also got motion sickness, so I can never play for too terribly long before I got uh-huh. please. But uh, yeah. So, on <laughs> well, wasn't to... that? Wasn't that going to happen no matter what with a Game Boy? I had a Game Boy Color. The ghosting was oh. le- less severe. Okay, so you came in much, much later then into this whole thing. And then an advance and all that stuff. Anyways, yeah, Department is- of Corrections, okay. yeah. I have the pen right here to write on your forehead, and we will see what sort of scarlet letter you will receive. Okay, September 2000, do your worst. 2001. 2001, you're right. Oh, I'm just reading your notes. You wrote September oh, 2000. Don't, don't blame this on me, Carl. <laughs> I already self-corrected before this. All right. So, you said Devolver Games. No, Devolver Digital is the <sighs> actual name of this quirky publisher who does strange things, including parody press conferences at E3. And on from that... You said that Jeff Tennell's uh, company that he uh, founded after uh, Dynamics was called Gearbox. No, that is not a Gearbox. Uh, I made sure to go and look this up just in case it was like, you know, a case where there were two companies that were named the same thing. Like, did you know that there was a PC pinball developer uh, named Cinematronics that existed in the late 90s? No, I did not. Yeah, they they had nothing to do with the uh, with the original cinematronics, but yeah, uh, but no, it was not called Gearbox. I can't remember exactly what it was called because I wasn't sure what was what. Um, I think Garage Games. Uh, was Garage there. Games, that's yeah. what it was. Not Gearbox. Yeah, Garage Games. Why did I think Gearbox? How did I get to Gearbox? <laughs> oh, well. okay. And next up, we have a correction from a patron. Yes, and this comes uh, from our good friend uh, Vito, and I'm going to kill your last name, Belochkin, I'm guessing, but I'm probably killing that. You can send me a comment. And uh, he corrected me quite accurately because I was talking about how uh, back then Adobe Flash was a thing, but in fact, Adobe was not the owner of Flash at the time. It would have been Macromedia Flash. So, yes, got me on that one. Yes, and and got me as well, for I forgot. Uh, (laughs) I was there. I I downloaded Macromedia Flash back in the day. But yes. Yeah, me too, me too. I love that thing. I mean, it was so many good games that you could 
play on your work computer without having to install them, you know? Or even just in the case of not having the best uh, internet connection of which to download games, just being able to go on the internet and play them uh, through through your browser. It was a good time. Good time. Yeah, it was. It was. I I am of the Flash generation, uh, and I, I hope the best to those who are attempting to preserve those games for the future. But... Uh, the last thing that I, I must uh, say to you, Carl, Mr. Nasty, Nasty Carl, one of oh the last no. things you say in the last episode, cursing on air in this very oh. stringent voice. I know that this is not always meant to be totally PG, but come on, just be a little bit more tactful, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Okay, I, I, will, I will try to keep my beeps and my beeps and my beep, beep, beeps, beep, 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 beeps of beep, beep, beeps. Under control. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Carl, we are done for September of the Ones. And I hope to see you all here next time for October, when I will be refreshed and rejuvenated and probably falling apart, for I have a lot of work to do. Yeah, Maybe you're we'll heading off. That. Well, yeah. Uh, I look forward to all the research you gather, and there's one particular issue we've discussed that hopefully you'll be able to clarify if I've got it right or not. So. Oh, yeah, the, the one from like two episodes ago or something? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm looking forward to that, because I've really got a feeling it's the missing link, but we will find out. Okay, uh, Ethan, as always, thank you for your service, and until next time. Salut. You know, again, as last episode, I tried to find something to put the finger on and to blame you for not being a good enough research monkey. However, also this time, I think you did a pretty decent job and Ethan didn't find too much stuff going wrong with us. Or, no, or no, so. <laughs> no, 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 we, uh, we, we, we sometimes, sometimes accidentally fumble our way into accuracy. Uh, but yeah. Ethan would then just say, hey, it's, you know, the 2000s already – Stuff is far more accurate. The level of journalism in this area has gotten much better. Mm -hmm. And so there is less to get mm -hmm. wrong because less is based off of myth and hearsay as opposed to the 40-year jumps where the next 40-year jump is going to have a lot of corrections. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. So what you're <laughs> saying basically is it's not an accomplishment. So – it is an accomplishment. <laughs> it's just not necessarily all my my doing. So there you go. Okay. An accomplishment for <laughs> video game history and professionalism as a whole. But <clears throat> let us move on now from uh, the past. Let's leave the past in the past and move on to a different past by turning on our time machine and heading back to October of 2001. Nintendo's GameCube system. We're unveiling the Xbox. 2001. This is a computer game. Welcome to October of 2001. Peter, what is our first story? Xboxes are coming off the line, but at what cost? A Merrill Lynch report estimates that the first run of Xbox consoles will cost $375 each to manufacture. If the estimated 600,000 launch units sell at retail for $299, Microsoft will be facing a shortfall of $45 million. Isn't it interesting that the business model of those consoles, at least in the beginning of their lifetime, is to waste money on the consoles which you then gain by licensing and uh, fees and games? Uh, yes and no. Uh, for example, Nintendo doesn't do that. Yeah. Oh, Nintendo well. sells <laughs> at Nintendo cost, is but it's story. Nintendo is yeah. Nintendo. Uh, the other consoles, there is the general idea. Some consoles, I mean, that you might think are selling at a loss or not. But yeah, this one is extremely, extremely hardcore in that sense that this was probably the biggest difference between production cost and loss of any machine out at this point. And I mean, it wasn't something that was originally there. Like the Atari 2600 and the Fairchild Channel F did not, they sold at a profit. Uh, so this was something that came later with the licensing structures. And 
I mean, really doesn't take off properly until this generation. I don't even know if the PlayStation was as such a loss leader or just a barely break even business. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, the difference in production cost and revenue by those things is enormous here. Um, do we actually know when they were able to produce at, uh, at a cost level that they were at least breaking even with the consoles? Uh, I don't, I don't know of any hard and fast numbers on this. I don't think Microsoft ever released exact numbers on this. Mm-hmm. But, uh, if they did, it probably wasn't or just barely was with the Xbox. Remember, the Xbox isn't going to have a very long lifespan. So while it will have some time to get economies of scale going and the price of the hardware, especially those hard drives that are in the Xbox, which are one of the major components pushing up the cost, uh, do come down in price over, I think, the three-year lifespan of the console. It's three or four years, and mm-hmm. not much more than that before the uh, 360 comes out. So mm-hmm. it's not going to be... If it, if it does come down, it's going to come down to about a break even point, maybe a slight profit, but they're also going to have to do, uh, price cuts to the console during its lifespan. So it's never really going to be a huge, huge, it's never going to be something that they're making money off the hardware. It's always in their minds just a way of breaking into the market. Mm. And they have. Oh, to. well, that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Also, they have the financial power to like sell whatever loss they want. I mean, they have the financial power to give out those things for free. They're sitting on a pile of money and $45 yeah. million dollars to them is a rounding error. So unlike a company like Nintendo or Sega or even Sony, <laughs> they have the cash to do this. And they have mm-hmm. so many other much larger products out there that this really doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh well. I wonder um, about this this console generation. I mean, they I think they are breaking even, but just the amount of consoles sold, you know, if you put it in relation with the R and D costs and the time it needs to like get an amortization of those R and D costs. I think this year, this this time is way longer than it used to be. Uh, for the current generation, yeah. the PS5s and the Series S, or, or, yeah. or is it X, Series S, uh, you have to remember they're using a lot of standardized components. The R&D costs are not well, well, what you yeah, think they are because they're using basically the same chipset in both systems. The, the real cost here is the software development costs to mm-hmm. build up exclusive titles. Yeah. Oh, well. And so, well, yeah, they're, they're selling it probably at a loss or at a break even point. Uh, even though Nintendo Switch is out selling them by gobs, it's still one of those things where it's like, uh, you know, Nvidia is going to be developing the, this chip tech anyway. Didn't matter mm-hmm. that it was going into a game console. They were still going to develop the chipsets. So yeah, we'll have to see, uh, you know, the current gen, isn't playing quite as much with that because they are using off the shelf parts, the designing of brand new stuff while still has to be done. You still have to do motherboard and everything Mm -hmm. is not going to be quite as huge as it was back in the day. And the Xbox was kind of the forerunner of this because they were using a lot of standard existing computer components in the hardware design. As opposed to, for example, Sony with its Emotion Engine uh, chipset and stuff that was all custom hardware for that system. Yeah, well, this is actually true. I'm trying to think whether or not there's actually anything that's not off the shelf in one of the new consoles. I mean, we're not talking about software, it's just hardware. Well, I mean, you're still going to have the controllers and you're going to have probably some minor stuff but yeah for the most part it doesn't pay off anymore to do Mm. the custom things number one it's going to make uh porting game engines and stuff over to the platform more difficult Mm. and uh for third parties to do a system exclusive requires them to sacrifice a lot of sales so Mm. the only way that they're really going to do a system exclusive is if they see a large enough uh, base um, uh, for that hardware um, uh, 
or uh, and you know customer base for it, or yeah. there's something very specific about the hardware that they wouldn't be able to do on another system. But even then, it's not going to really pay off to lose the market share from the other platform. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So oh well. Okay, but that is not the only thing we have to talk about mm-hmm. about Xbox. No, no, there's a lot of stuff going on with Xbox. Ones. For instance, third-party confidence in Xbox is shaken. Analysts are reporting an increasing hesitancy by third-party publishers to support Microsoft's upcoming game console. After a lackluster E3 showing, especially in light of a very strong showing by Nintendo with GameCube, several publishers that were eager to jump on board the new console are now hesitant. Acclaims Rod Cousins has no plans for exclusive titles for the Xbox and fears that Sony's lead will be insurmountable by the time Xbox goes into wide distribution in 2002. Boy, were they wrong. (laughs) Not really, no. PlayStation 2 becomes, uh, may still be, besides maybe the Wii, the most sold game console, proper plug-into-a-TV game console of all time. I mean, uh, the PlayStation 2 is a juggernaut, uh, and he is right. Uh, the PlayStation 2 is just going to be way, way ahead of the game. Xbox is never going to crack uh, – I don't even think they crack 20% of the U.S. market, let alone any double-digit percentage of the Japanese market. So, no, no, no. Uh, he is right that the PlayStation 2 is going to have so many top-tier games – and it's not reviewed in any of the magazines this month, but uh, this in October of 2001, we get the launch of Grand Theft Auto 3 on PlayStation 2. And so by the time the Xbox shows up, it's not just going up against PS2. It's going up against PS2 with GTA 3. And yeah, that's one of the reasons why the Xbox is never really going to steal the PS2's thunder. Yeah. 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 Well, but 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 still, um, I mean, the the original Xbox actually was a, I mean, it ran pretty neat. Oh, the Xbox was an amazing piece of hardware, and the built-in hard drive made some amazing games like Jade Empire and Knights of the Old Republic possible. And later on, would get ports of all of the all three of the major PlayStation uh, GTA games. But it's going to get those way later. You know, and mm-hmm. the big advantage of the Xbox is the four controller ports and the online connectivity. So once we get that Halo multiplayer, that is going to give Xbox its niche. And the Halo series will, until this, to this day, still be the driving force of Xbox sales or one of the driving forces of Xbox sales. Because Sony still really doesn't have that multiplayer action game uh killer app i mean they 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 get time splitters but without the network capability it's always going to be a limited niche experience where you would need four playstation 2s and four screens to play it properly and xbox is just like well we can do four player split screen or you can play it over the internet not a, not on day one, but you will be able to play it over the internet. And that's uh, something that the PlayStation experience never manages to really uh, take advantage of. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Oh, Lord. <sighs> but again, talking about system exclusives. Talking about system exclusives. Malice goes multi-platform. One of the early and few Xbox exclusives, Argonaut Software's Malice, will now also be coming to the PS2. Publisher Vivendi seems to have gotten cold feet and announced that the game will be available on both systems. (laughs) Um, This also is in accordance to the lost confidence in the Xbox, isn't it? Oh, yes. I mean, Malice was one of those first titles. It's this cute little girl with this giant hammer, and it was a technical marvel. They were showing it off, you know, and it looked like pre-rendered, but it was real-time, blah, blah, blah. 
And it's coming from Argonaut. Now, Argonaut were early pioneers in 3D graphics, already on home computers in Europe. They're a UK company. They were the guys who did Star Fox for the Super Nintendo. They designed the chip that made that possible. So these guys, I mean, when Argonaut is going to do some 3D graphics, everybody's like, ooh, cool. Uh, unfortunately, Argonaut n never really – they were good with the tech – not always that good with the game design. And so Malice ends up being basically a dog of a game. And they release one other game the same year, which is Catwoman based off of the movie. And while Catwoman, the movie was terrible, the video game wasn't any better. Mm. And uh, <laughs> that's the end of Argonaut, unfortunately. Okay. So they, they had a very illustrious career going all the back, uh, way back to the eighties. But uh, yeah, they, they just, they never built up any franchises that they owned and they never really had, uh, they had great tech, but they never had a signature gameplay or signature, uh, game style that they could call their own and they suffered because of it. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think that I know any of them. Argonaut software games, including Star Fox. Atlas. Star Fox. Or no, what was it? Whatever that. it was. You haven't played Star Fox on the Super no. Nintendo? No, I have not. I have not. Oh, my Because, goodness. Dude, That's... I mean, back in the day, my access to games was limited to what my parents were able or willing to buy me. Oh, okay, okay. It's, uh, and when we come around to it, we will have to set you down for seven minutes in heaven with Star Fox. <laughs> because yeah, that is that. like... The that yeah that that's just a milestone for console gaming. So okay, we'll we'll get around to it. We'll get around to it. Uh, Wonderful. To, so sad. Okay, yeah, good. I, <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint. I was five. Um, okay. Anywho, uh, moving on. What Xbox lacks in exclusives, it makes up in emulation. It's great they try to hold it until today. Yeah, there you go. Reports are <laughs> reports are coming out that developers have been porting existing emulators like MAME to the Xbox dev kit. Many speculate that with its massive 64 megs of RAM and hard drive, it could quickly become the most hacked console ever. So, first question. Yes. Oh, there you are, because it became awful quiet right now. Uh, the first question would have been, you. are you still there? Second question. <laughs> <laughs> Second question is, um, did it become the uh, most tech console ever? Oh, yes, definitely. I actually bought my first Xbox specifically so I could hack it. Well, so... I, the first one I got, I hacked. And then I bought a okay. second one that had already been hacked. Yes. Walk me through the process. How do you hack a console? Well, uh, this one, the Xbox had a little problem. There were three games in the launch lineup mm -hmm. where what the programmers had done in order to get more performance out of the machine was that when you put in the disc, the first thing that it did was it dumped the operating system out of memory to free up <laughs> more memory. Which is what most consoles do. I mean, most of the consoles are doing this. And yeah. it was an old trick from home computers like the Commodore 64. The first thing you did when you loaded a game was the the program would then dump the basic kernel out of memory to free up more memory or dump uh, certain uh, key, key maps and stuff out of memory. Anything that wasn't necessary, get it out so that you could free up as much of that 64K of memory. Well... Here they were doing the same thing with the 64 megs of RAM. They would just dump the operating system that was already there out of memory and replace it with some miniature version of their own or something else that would get the job done. Well, the problem was, and I think okay. it was uh, – one of them was sort of a Mech Assault game. I can't remember the exact name of it. Maybe it was even Mech Assault. No, I can't remember now. Uh, and – one or two others, and this is all online. I'll put a link to something describing it, where if you put this game in and then you removed it immediately while it was loading, or once it had loaded, you took out the disk and put in another disk, you could then use a backdoor hack in their version of an operating system that they had loaded into memory in order to run the game. 
So the original Xbox operating system didn't have that backdoor, but this these games did. And then you could suddenly get full access to the hard drive, rewrite stuff, and then suddenly start installing stuff to the hard drive without going through the official channels. Hmm. This is actually pretty cool. Yeah, uh, it was. That was a soft mod hack. Mm. Now it was a little bit unstable. If you didn't do it right, you screwed up the hard drive, which was very yeah. hard to recover. Uh, now another way of doing it was to basically put a to replace one of the chips on the hard drive uh, on the motherboard. So that would be a chip hack. And mm. uh, my second Xbox had that, and I bought this from somebody uh, who had already done it. So I basically did it on the cheap. And he was very mm -hmm. ticked off that I was getting it for so little, but he couldn't find anybody else who wanted to buy it. But it became like my go-to emulation box in the house. So mm -hmm. then I plugged in an X arcade stick, and there were great parties, you know, four-player X-Men arcade playthroughs and stuff while people were drunk. Great entertainment right there. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so it was it was basically just a PC. Anything that you could run on the PC, you could easily adapt for this. And because it had the built-in hard drive, you didn't have to, you know, goof around with anything. And once you were in the system, this is also where we get XBMC, the Xbox Media Center, which is still a, a program on Windows machines and Linux machines today to create um, media servers. All of this comes from this hacking scene. The Xbox hacking scene is huge. So yeah. as long as your MAME ROM fit within 64 megs of RAM, you were good to go. And virtually none of the old arcade games ate up more than a, a meg or two. So here you could put tons of stuff on that hard drive, load it up, and have your entire game library output into your television set without a problem. And that's what a lot of people did. And it would still run your Xbox games. You weren't ruining the Xbox uh, functionality. So yeah, yeah. And it was way cheaper than a comparative PC, a PC comparable in. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you wanted to buy a regular PC back then, especially one that maybe had in, uh, this is all before um, HDMI out. So you probably would have needed something with a S video uh, output and then just buying an S video cable back in the day. I remember I spent once mm. something like 20 bucks just for the S video cable so I could plug my computer <laughs> yeah, to a television cool. set. Mm. It was nuts. Uh, so here everything was included. Everything was up and running. And as long as you got it modded right, you were good to go. And yeah. then you could always put a bigger hard drive in it too. That was the other thing. You just open up the box. There was plenty of room to move. You pop out a hard drive, pop in the new one, and uh, put a boot disk on there, and you're good to go. Hmm. Yeah. So It's actually uh, too easy. <laughs> it was way too easy. And, I mean, there were stories of people using them as servers mm -hmm. in third world countries and stuff. I mean, it, it, it was basically just a Windows box uh, waiting to be used. So, no, uh, good times, uh, fun stuff. And this is all coming out before the machine launches. So, you know, you, you know it's coming. And a lot of people bought them just for that reason. I know I was one of them. Uh -huh. I'm admitting that. I should. <laughs> I'm admitting that. It's over 20 years ago. Who cares? So. <laughs> yeah. Another time, another life. Hey, hey um, I, I never pirated any Xbox software. I bought all my Xbox software. So, there, that... My, Microsoft should be happy about that, maybe. Who knows? Okay. She didn't do any damage. You know, I'm just, and you know, I know we want to move on, but but still, I'm just wondering how can you have a, a console where I give away the entire control of your operating system so easily? You know, I, I mean, mean yeah, was, I understand. It wasn't so easily. I mean, you still needed to know what you were doing. The average user who bought this was never going to be able to pull that off. Yeah. Okay. That's that's the reality. The average user wasn't going to be able to pull it off. But for the tech savvier people, this was going to become an option. I love how you just easily flattered yourself. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, I am not a tech savvy person, but I was tech savvier than the average. Yeah. Th well, this is true. This is true. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, speaking about pirates and moving on, Nintendo outlines online plans for the GameCube. While Nintendo's next console won't have network capabilities out of the box, both broadband and LAN adapters will be made available. The first game rumored to support internet play is Sonic Team's Fantasy Star Online. If you were outside of Japan, that would also become the only game to support it. I love your typo there. If you were in the outside of Japan, <laughs> basically the rest of the world. Awesome. Um, what I really love about Nintendo is that up to this point, up to until today, and I think even uh, up uh, until the near future, they are not able to provide a viable online service. That's not true. I mean, Splatoon's is all about the online play. And they have a bunch of other games. I mean, you can still play Minecraft on it without a problem. Oh, yeah, you can play games online now, but, you know, compared to the other provider of consoles and online services, I mean, I like the approach that it's like 20 bucks a year and you're good to play online, so this is nice. Well, I mean, and that's very much in line with everybody else's service, like Xbox Gold or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, at this point, Nintendo and Sony, remember, Sony also doesn't have online support out of the box. You need to buy an extra adapter. You need to buy the hard drive. And so both of these Japanese companies are not seeing the real potential of Internet-based gaming. Uh, there's, there's a couple of theories for this, uh, like, uh, internet adoption, the home in Japan, isn't that great at this point, uh, because they haven't had the same history with free local telephone calls that the United States had, which fueled the boom. Same thing in Europe. You, mm -hmm. you just don't have the penetration of internet, uh, access through home phone oh, yeah. lines. Now, remember the Japanese are way ahead in cell phones at this point. As we've talked about several times on the show, you know, they've got, you know, those great little flip phones and stuff with color screens and they can play games and uh, all these marketplaces and online functionalities. We talked about the uh, uh, Dreamcast online uh, system through cell phones. So they're just kind of missing the whole idea that you're going to do this through an Internet connection in your house because they really see it still as part of that cell phone culture uh but mm. in the united states this is why xbox takes off because it does have the online play features and uh this is going to be one of those things where they kind of missed the boat where the dreamcast really had pioneered it this is also why fantasy star online this was a game on the dreamcast originally and it was online gaming on the dreamcast and uh, as we'll see in our next story, that's still something that's going on, even though the Dreamcast is dead and inventories are gone. But it is one of those things where the uh, Nintendo is just going to be way too late to the party. There's only like four games that even use this or five games. And uh, some of the games will only use LAN, so high speed. Some will only use dial-up. And it's just basically a mess, and it doesn't really get you anywhere that you want to go. Not on uh, GameCube, at least. No, it's just way too early for that. Yeah. Even 2001. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah. But speaking of online gaming... Yeah. Alien Front Online brings voice to Dreamcast multiplayer. The Japan-exclusive arcade game Alien Front is coming to the Dreamcast as Alien Front Online. Not only will up to eight players be able to battle it out online, but the game will come bundled with Sega's Dreamcast microphone, originally used by the game Seaman, to allow for talking smack online. <laughs> I like that in 2001 they're expanding the Dreamcast. Well, yeah, I mean, the software is there. I don't know if the arcade game was utilizing a uh, Naomi board, which would have been a Dreamcast, but it wouldn't surprise me. I'd have to look that up again. But, uh, yeah, this is one of those last games. But you have to remember, the Dreamcast had a relatively strong install base, 
Yeah. Uh, the online capabilities were still there. So it kind of makes sense, but it also shows you that difference between the US and the Japanese market mm-hmm. that this game that's basically supposed to be played online only gets released in North America. Because that's the only place where you're really going to be able to pull off online play in any significant uh, fashion. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. And the fun thing is that those microphones are only bundled with it because they still had them left over because Seaman didn't sell the way they hoped for and they had mm. a whole bunch of microphones left. So they're just throwing it in with the game in order to get the, rid of the old stock. Which, mm. considering all things, they may have actually just released the game in order to get rid of the microphones. I have no yeah. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Yeah. But you know what? Uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We might be playing that game very soon. We'll see. We'll see. What? We're gonna we're gonna see if we can get all of the moderators of the show together and uh, do some online multiplayer. But we still need to work out uh, our our good good friend and uh, co host of the show. John is working on the technical aspects mm-hmm. of that. So we'll see. Hopefully, that will be coming to a video screen near you soon. Mm-hmm. Okay, but we'll moving on. Moving on, um, ECTS is abandoned by the majors, you professor, you. Yes, the European Computer Trade Show in London was all but abandoned by major publishers. Sony, Nintendo, EA, Eidos, Virgin, Activision, Acclaim, Konami, etc. all snubbed the show. Only Ubisoft, Blizzard, Joe Wood, and CDV showed up alongside smaller developers, publishers, and distributors looking to make deals. So, why did they abandon the ECTS? Uh, the European show basically has just been, I mean, the show's been around since the late 80s uh, in one form or the other, but the problem is with the rise of E3. Mm-hmm. It's just become easier to have one focal point for the industry. Yeah. And showing up at these shows is just very expensive. The European market just isn't that strong. And at this point in time, it is still so fragmented. Yeah. uh, That it is hard for anybody to justify those costs. Now, uh, Blizzard is going to use this as an announcement event Mm -hmm. so they came out uh, and announced that they would be debuting a new game at the show and it was a little thing called World of Warcraft Uh, now WoW wouldn't actually come out until 2004 but they showed off first uh, artwork uh, sketches, some designs and video Mm -hmm. of it now the funny thing is that a lot of people were super super disappointed because Warcraft 3, which is the game everybody was looking forward to, has been delayed again. <laughs> uh, and and they had already canceled the point-and-click adventure game that was supposed to bridge the story between Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 3. Now Warcraft 3 keeps getting delayed. Now they're talking about doing an MMO. And for the hardcore strategy people, this is like, Seriously? MMO? We don't want no MMO. What are we going to do with an MMO? So there are people who are not impressed by WoW, which is kind Mm. of funny in retrospect. Yeah. Uh, But at the same time, you know, it's – there's so many MMOs popping up. I mean there's – it almost feels like when you go through the magazines, there's like a new one every month. And Mm. uh, the fact that, you know, Blizzard guys are now also going to do it. Uh, there's hope that it will be the MMO to end all MMOs, or at least it's going to be a really, really competent one as opposed to a lot of the ones that are coming out which are half-baked and don't really uh, yeah. get the job done. So, yeah, that's that's that. <laughs> that's that. I mean, it's just interesting how history uh, repeats itself over and over again. Oh, what um, do you mean by that? I mean, I mean, uh, two things. First, the uh, the story of Blizzard. I mean, didn't exactly the same happen like one or two years ago? What with uh... with Diablo Four and then them announcing a mobile yeah. game, which yeah. everybody hated on, and now I don't know whether it's published yet, but 
haven't heard a lot about it since. But still, and then the E3 being abandoned by Sony and... Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is weird because yeah, the idea of the trade show mm. uh, sort of being not left behind, but becoming less important in yeah. deal making, is also partially a sign that the major publishers are not relying on local distributors anymore. Mm -hmm. So well, once you have a deal with Activision, well, Activision is going to be doing the worldwide distribution. They don't need to go to the trade show and find a distributor yeah. for Portugal anymore. Exactly. They're just going to do it themselves. And as the European market becomes more unified and more standardized, mm -hmm. the need for those uh, local distributors and publishers becomes less and less and less. And so, yeah. yeah, in many ways, ECTS dies for the same reason that E3 is sort of not, I don't want to say breathing fumes, but not far from it. Yeah. I mean, I think E3, it's just a matter of a couple of years that this will die away. Yeah. I really and, think so. And if, I mean, E3 has become something where people go who aren't necessarily industry. It's a huge deal for gamers. I don't yeah. know how many deals are still made on the show floor like they were in the old days. Uh, and if you t listen to some of the interviews I've done in the past, like uh, Greg Fishbach or um, and not Michael Katz so much. He, was, uh, he wasn't really in it at the E3 point any longer. Uh, but some of these guys, they have these memories of uh, uh, Morici, for example – of going to E3 and it was really a place to make deals. And that has, I believe, died down just because the companies, the publishers have gotten so big, everything's mm -hmm. done internally. And when there is a new publisher or a new developer who wants to sell a game, they're not going to be showing it off at the show necessarily. Yeah. So, or they're just going to put it on Steam and then get a publishing deal after the fact. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those weird uh, evolutions of the market where it just may not be necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. I think the COVID pandemic really accelerated that trend. Okay. Yeah, the pandemic did not help. But you want to talk about something that will probably never die? <laughs> Go for it. Windows XP launches on October 25th. The latest and so far greatest version of Windows from a gamer's standpoint will hit the store. Uh, no. The latest and so far greatest version of Windows from a gamer's standpoint will hit the streets on the 25th of October, promising a much more stable work environment, better internet functionality, and DirectX support. The OS will be the go-to system for gamers for years to come. Not only for gamers. I think there's so many companies and so much, uh, well, computers and devices still using the Windows XP operating system in one form or another. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. XP becomes the workhorse. I mean, moving to XP was uh, just, it, it was finally the promise of 95 yeah. uh, made real. I mean, 95 was stable and everything else, but... There were so many aspects of 95 that just didn't quite work the way they were promised or the functionality, especially for games, wasn't quite there yet. XP mm -hmm. took all of that, simplified it, didn't eat up too many of your system resources. And uh, yeah, it was just an amazing operating system for so, so many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So – yeah, uh, and it's coming finally. We've talked about it in the past. Uh, a few of its features like the digital uh, copy protection and stuff. But yeah, so we're it's finally going to hit the street and the horrible nightmare that was ME will be no more. <laughs> oh, ME was bad. I had a computer with Windows ME. Oh, Lord. Oh, I know, Lord. I know. I actually convinced myself at some point that the computer – all computers crash every 30 minutes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, this was really bad. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Okay. okay. Uh, moving on. Monolith announces Shogo sequel. 
One of the best and most underrated FPS games of all time, Shogo Mobile Armor Division, is to get a sequel. This time it will be more of an action stealth affair in the vein of Metal Gear Solid. Ah, you're always putting in some topics that I can say absolutely nothing about. <laughs> I mean, I don't know okay, I okay, I'm just throwing this out there because <laughs> Shogo was one of my favorite games. I vaguely remember this notice out there that there was going to be a sequel, and it never came out. Yeah, and I was very disappointed. <laughs> disappointed. So yes, just thought I'd throw it in here because they announced it was coming, and I was like, "Ooh, this sounds so good." Especially after they also did uh, No One Lives Forever and the mm -hmm. stealth missions and that. And I was thinking, oh, that would be such a great combination. And no, didn't happen. So it occurs. Hmm. Yes. And okay. let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah, let's talk about something that I actually can talk about as well. EA secures the Lord of the Rings movie license. While the Literary Works license is still sitting with Sierra, despite the legal woes we reported on back in our November 2000 jump, EA has secured the rights to make games based on the upcoming Peter Jackson movies. The first game, The Two Towers, will be launching by the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, I like that they, and I know why, but I like that they didn't start with the, the first one, the, the Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah, I mean, uh, that they probably could have pulled off a game around that, but at the same time, they they got the license too late. Uh, Don Daglo mm -hmm. um, talked about this because his uh, development studio was the one that made the Two Towers game. Yeah, and we talked about it in the interview that you know that yeah they just didn't have the time to get uh, to get it out in time for that. They needed to wait for the Two Towers. Yeah, and then they. Oh well, actually, I've never played the two towers. I've played the uh, the third one, and I mean, this was basically just. I played it with a friend. I remember it was basically just a big uh, button mashing. Yeah, destroy everything on screen. It it, it was a glorified side scrolling beat em up, a beat -em -up. and the two yes. tower was as well. Yeah, the two okay. towers was as well. With uh, the primary thing was that you know you had Aragorn. Gimli and Legolas for the most part. And what that meant was that you had three very different types of characters with different abilities and different play styles that you then could play the game through with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I mean, this is, and this is basically what we did. We played the game together because playing it alone was a oh, lot. Yeah. Yeah. It was very, it was hard and it was kind of boring. But yeah. if you played it with a friend, it was actually a lot of fun. Just like most side scrolling beat em ups are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Sticking with EA, um, EA seeks licenses for LAN or LAN tournaments. Due to licensing right uncertainties, EA has announced that all professionally organized LAN parties must seek their approval before allowing any of their licensed sports titles to be played. Well, this is so EA. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so EA, but also it's a little bit a sign of the times, and uh, it makes sense. So they're paying a lot of money for licenses like FIFA, NHL, and Madden, and the NFL, and so forth. And when these land party organizers who are charging people money to come in, they're charging people, you know, uh, to play in the games. And, you know, they also have spectators watching the games, you know, who are waiting their turn and so forth. Yeah. The question is, ha what kind of license does that person need? to be able to be making money off the game. So if you just go into a store and you buy the game, you're buying a license for that software, for that for a copy of the software for personal mm -hmm. private use. Now, if you're, you know, organizing a whole bunch of machines for people to pay, play Quake, the only people who are who deal with that are id cuz id owns the IP or maybe whoever's publishing uh, Quake in the territory. But when you're dealing with a license like FIFA suddenly, now mm -hmm. the question is, does EA have an obligation to collect fees from the land party and then yeah. give a portion of those back to FIFA? Because imagine if FIFA then comes in and says, hey, people are making money off of our license and we're not getting anything out of this. This oh, yeah. has gone from just being, you know, people playing it in their home with their friends to 
maybe an esport. I mean, that a, entire idea of the professional gamer is sort of in the background at this point, uh, mm-hmm. with some tournaments m- m- handing out real cash prizes. So the question here is, is there a possibility that one of these uh, sports leagues could say, hey, EA, you violated our contract by not controlling the license. We get to pull it back, and if you want it back, you're going to have to pay a lot more money. And again, EA can't afford to lose one of these licenses because at this point, there are other studios that would love to pick up these licenses as well. So uh, yeah, okay. they're just – protecting their asses to make sure that, you know, nothing like this happens. So this is going to be a little bit of a dispute for a little while. Um, I didn't go too deep, so we'll probably hear about it again in the future. Uh, I, I couldn't find any resolution of the topic, but it is an issue that's coming up, especially in Europe where this kind of event is a more organized thing. Remember in the States, if you want to play, you're playing online. Yeah. Uh, but in Europe, the LAN party, the everybody brings their computer and you got 200 machines in a hall is a far more common occurrence than in the mm. U.S. at this point. Mm-hmm. OK. Yeah. Um, sticking with the legal stuff, um, Napster suffers a legal blow. After coming under pressure from music publishers, Napster began eliminating files that violated copyright on the basis of their file names. This, according to the company, eliminated 99.8% of all illegal content on the platform, but wasn't good enough for the courts. Their next step will be to audio fingerprint each file to make sure it doesn't contain violating material and shift to become a subscription service. Plans that would not come to fruition as it would see service in July of 2001. And again, this is where we see that the publication date of a magazine d- doesn't necessarily mean that the events are still topical. So if, I apologize to everybody who's like, wait, if they ceased operation in July, why are we talking about in the October issue? It's because that is still, you know, delays in uh, in publication. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, this whole idea of digitally fingerprinting probably wouldn't have worked back then. I mean, we get it nowadays. Mm-hmm. This is how um, systems like Shazam can identify songs and uh, and things like this. But it back in 2001, this would have required so much additional processing power and yeah. uploading part of the song beforehand before you pass it on and – at creating a gatekeeper function, there's just no way they could have pulled this off. Exactly. Um, still, I wonder. You said that 99.8 percent of all the illegal context on the uh, content on the platform was removed. Do you have yeah. an estimate of how much of the actual content that was? Well, 99.8 percent of the illegal. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean the the percentage of quote unquote legal content on Napster was a bunch of garage bands, you know, uh, putting their songs on there for distribution. Uh, That was such an infinitely (laughs) unbelievably insignificant portion of what was on Napster that it didn't matter. Yeah, I I thought so. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, uh, that was the kind of thing that the, that was the original purpose of MySpace was for bands to get to uh, be known. MySpace was originally for local bands, mm-hmm. but um, and then it became just a general uh, social media platform. And uh, yeah, the, this whole thing just it, it was Napster was a piracy service at the end yeah. of the day. And there was no reason to go on there for anything that wasn't illegal. And when you were searching for files, the only way to discover a file was through the file name. So any attempt to change the file name in order to bypass the file name safeguards Mm -hmm. was going to end up with the problem that nobody was going to be able to find your file anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, the, it, it, it killed the system. But by then, uh, other peer-to-peer software uh, solutions were coming through. Nutella was a big one. And uh, I, I don't, I don't want to lean out on a, uh, 
how, which other ones, uh, whether or not LimeWire was already active at this point or whatever other variants existed. But yeah, I mean, file sharing was the Bitcoin mining of its day, so to speak. It was everywhere. Everybody did it. Um, or at least everybody who desperately, desperately wanted to keep their computer running all day long did it. So <laughs> there you go. This <laughs> wouldn't have worked in old Germany. Letting your no, run no. Lying no. all day. <laughs> Unless you were somehow connected to a university and you got it yeah. to the university, you were screwed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, them pay by the minute times. And this is not, and this is just 20 years ago. Oh, Lord. Yeah, Man, so. we're getting old. Um, moving on. Compaq to merge with HP. Struggling PC maker Compaq will be merging with struggling PC maker HP. Together, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Together, they should be able to survive. They would have revenues rivaling IBM's. This is good. They're struggling. The business model doesn't work. So let's get together. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it actually does kind of work out for them, though. Uh, now, Compaq ends up being dissolved um, a, a few years later. Well, more than a few years later. The brand state sticks around for a while. But they ultimately do dissolve Compaq, and HP is still, still around. So uh, it does help get them over that uh, hill. Yeah, in this time period when uh, the PC business is getting more and more cutthroat, and the business models are shifting. I mean, Dell, for example, is doing their you know order it online, have it put together, custom made and stuff, as opposed to you know these guys who are still trying to sell through retail outlets, which means mm -hmm. that you have to build the PC and then hope somebody buys it. When they don't, by the time it gets back to you as a return or as unsold stock, it's outdated hardware in there. You're kind of screwed. So they, they're going to have to reinvent their business models a little bit, but they will survive this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just the idea. I mean, of, of course, they obviously it was successful for HP. It was a good idea for HP, but it's just why are you failing as a company? You're not failing. And well, mostly you're failing because the business model doesn't work. Uh, no. That's most of the time, but sometimes it's just you're not big enough. Mm -hmm. Remember, economies of scale play a role, especially around this time in the United States, you're seeing a consolidation at retail. So Amazon yeah. is out there, but they're not really a factor yet. But what has happened is that a whole bunch of stores have collapsed. Yeah, uh, It's around this time, I believe, that Circuit City collapses, maybe a little bit later – a whole bunch of local or regional chains collapse. Uh, everything ends up being Walmart. And what ends up happening is that when Walmart puts in an order, they don't put it in an order for one group of stores. They put it in for every store, which suddenly means that you may be a giant company, but can you really produce enough units fast enough to supply every Walmart on a specific day? Yeah. Yeah. And if you can't, then you can't accept the order out. from Walmart. So uh, suddenly this idea of having 12 relatively large but still not humongous PC manufacturers just doesn't work. Just because you can't fulfill the orders to the giant retailers that are nationwide. And uh, this is the pressure that they're facing. They need to expand. They need to have the extra production capability that they don't have unless they merge yeah 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 okay, 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 okay. So, so it's not a fundamental of the business model it's just you suddenly are facing different circumstances and you just may not have the resources to scale up true that true that and okay. that's why the lawyer is teaching the mba how business works Ah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Please continue. Ah, Lord. Moving on. Titus takes control of Interplay. The struggling game publisher Interplay has had a controlling share of its stock purchased by French publisher Titus. While Titus already had 31% of the company, they have now increased their holdings to 51%. Interplay has been showing losses with 
only their Boulder Skate franchise apparently being profitable and 3D RPG Torn getting canceled. Yeah. Ah, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. I mean, <laughs> I, I really had a problem right now. I was, I was, uh, I mixed up Interplay and Infograms. So. Ah, uh, okay, okay. And this is, yeah, the, the problem I was just saying. Um, hmm. It, it's still the time that the French, well, game publishers are sitting on a mountain of cash or are they slowly in decline by 2001? Uh, I'm, I'd have to look at the exact dates, but at this point, the problems are starting to show. Yeah. So what's happening is they still have a pile of cash. I don't believe their markets have completely collapsed. We don't have a, a dot com bubble burst yet mm -hmm. there. It's coming. Yeah. Uh, or, or at least or, or it may have already happened. It's just this news is a little delayed. But what is happening is that they're, they've overextended themselves. Yeah. So Titus, uh, we talked a while ago, about uh, a year or two ago, about how Titus had invested in Interplay and helped uh, bolster them because they yeah. wanted to get uh, a better foothold in the U.S. market and also access to more high-quality software because that's always been Titus's problem, that high-quality software is just not what they do. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, this Interplay was supposed to be the one doing that. Interplay had its Black Isle label, which was the one publishing RPGs like Fallout and uh, the Boulder's Gate series. And so they are hoping that this is going to do it. Unfortunately, Interplay has also had a lot of missteps. They've, uh, they've had to basically give up control of the Star Trek license. Uh, they were, and they had to also, uh, kill things like Torn, which was this 3D RPG. Remember, the Boulder's Gate series at this oh. point is still a 2D RPG with pre-rendered yeah. graphics. And so everything's going 3D. They know they have to go 3D at some point. Torn was supposed to be their big entry into that Fallout 3D or Fallout 3, uh, which was also supposed to be a 3D game, is also going to get canceled. So they, they're having a hard time moving into the 3D space. Neverwinter Nights is on the drawing board, but it's still also quite a ways away. And this is kind of something we've talked about in the past where the transition of RPGs into 3D has been extremely difficult because uh, they require an immense amount of detail to work. Mm. Uh, whereas, you know, a shooter is basically just a shooter. Plus, RPGs are usually played from a third-person point of view where you see everything from above, which means that you have to render a lot more of the scenery than you would with a first-person perspective. This is also why the Elder Scrolls series always kind of worked in 3D because mm -hmm. you didn't have to render as much. Yeah. And... Uh, and you could never do a party, so you didn't have to render multiple player characters. Yeah. And uh, the computers of this time are getting better, but they're still kind of chugging along. Ultima 9, we talked about how that was an absolute cluster of me a, a huge mess because – and this is the other factor with RPGs. They take a tremendously long time to develop. A shooter can probably get pushed out at this point at 18 months. RPGs are usually in development for three to four years, and if you're trying to do it in 3D graphics, well, how do you predict where the technology is going to be in three to four years? If you were trying to push somebody a, a game that was three to four years old technically at this point, it's going to look terrible. Yeah, I mean, the 3D accelerator cards are only about six years old, and there was no way to predict that DirectX was going to become the big thing. This is what happened to Ultima 9. By the time it came out, they had bet that the Voodoo cards were going to be the technology to build the game around. And unfortunately, 3D effects had died before the game came out. So suddenly you have to sort of patch in other 3D renderers and stuff, and it all doesn't work. And so cracking that nut of the 3D RPG is going to be one of the real problems for Black Isle and Interplay. This is where we see Torn is going to get canceled. What would have been Fallout 3 gets canceled. The, the, there will be later a different game called Fallout 3 that has nothing to do with it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, once Interplay completely collapses and loses the IP. And, uh, yeah, it's just a very bad situation for them to be in because their big money maker, Baldur's Gate, as amazing an RPG series as it is, is not 3D. And one of the magazines this month also had a great preview of Dungeon Siege, which yeah. is going to be a action RPG mm-hmm. in 3D that does the 3D yeah. amazingly well. It looks it great, especially for the time. But it's an action RPG. You run through it and kill everything. It's not the in-depth, dialogue-heavy you know, tons of customization and be able to, you know, figure out different plots and side quests and stuff. It's very linear. Yeah. And that can be hammered out in a period of time where your technology doesn't get outdated before it comes out. And this is where the interplay is never going to crack this nut and the tightest money is not going to help. It's just going to put pressure on them to push something out because they need more revenue uh and then we will see them do you know boulder skate dark alliance one and two uh fallout brotherhood of steel which are action rpgs for consoles but it's it's all going to be too little too late oh well yeah the company's (laughs) not dead yet that's why it's at the end of the show (laughs) i was about to say and they're going the way of the dodo they will they will but not quite yet we're not Not there yet no, um, but still, I mean, we're sticking with stuff getting too old and too outdated to handle what they're supposed to handle well. And we're moving, and this was a horrible transition, still we're moving over to the next topic, which is Harvard study claims game ratings underreport violence. A study by Harvard researcher Kimberly M. Thompson has found that the ESRB rating system fails to accurately warn of violent content in games. Of the 55 E-rated games, which should be for everyone, she found significant violence present in several titles. The study's definition is an act of violence to another designed to cause harm. One of the examples she named was the violence fest known as Ms. Pac-Man. You know, I love when all people try to figure out how video game and youth culture works. Oh, and the problem is, Miss Pac-Man is almost 20 years old at this point. Yeah. Uh, now, granted, it's one of those games that keeps getting re-released uh, in bundles and whatever else. So it does have an ESRB rating, and it's still something you can buy. But yeah, and this is where... This study could have been taken seriously, but the moment they put Ms. Pac-Man in here, Mm -hmm. that becomes the thing everybody makes fun of. And I've I've read several reports on this from different publications, and every single one of them mentioned Ms. Pac-Man. This was the one you could not write about the story without mentioning Ms. Pac-Man. Seriously, (laughs) the one where you eat the ghosts after they try to kill you? And uh, I mean, if you say it like that, there's a whole lot of violence in there. (laughs) Well, and this is the thing. I mean, the question is, what is the violence? I mean, by that definition, Monopoly is just terrible. Now, granted, Monopoly was designed to be terrible in this regard, because if somebody lands on your property and they can't pay, basically you take everything they've got and force them into destitution. Uh, which was the lesson they were trying to teach because it was an anti-capitalist game. But, uh, I mean, that's a violent game. And the question then becomes, you know, what level of violence is acceptable or what level of violence is deemed to be okay in, I mean, in society? It's pretty simple. If you have capitalistic violence, it's so like, taking away everything you have because you by accident landed on a hotel field then this is fine because why are you not able to afford what you want to have like having a stay in the hotel well yeah but it's not like you have a choice it's chance the roll of the dice forced you there the roll of the dice by chance you ended up in a situation you couldn't afford it wasn't your choice I mean 
Uh, now I, okay, and now we're losing it, all the listeners because we're going off on on a whole tangent about the yeah. the metaphor a metaphorical world of monopoly. But <laughs> yes, um, just to set things straight, I was being sarcastic. I know, um, I know, I know, I know. I was being sarcastic. No, because I just you know. Um, and this is a little bit back to the banter session. I uh, like to, you know, when I'm bored or trying to remember, to kids, we talked. The banter section was coming back at some point. Yeah, here um, it is. Here it is. Um, I like to browse through uh, Nine Gag, and you know, just, just Nine Gag. Yeah. What is that? Like a BDSM it's, thing or? Do bulimia nine gag? No, like? it's this kids thingy where we have memes and funny pictures and whatnot. You know the ah. stuff you look at your phone and you actually don't have to use your brain. It's awesome for falling asleep. Oh, I thought that was Facebook. Okay, yeah, keep going. Yeah, I'm not using Facebook anymore. <laughs> yeah, I um, me but neither. still, um, and what I really like about nine gag is not the memes, but it's it's the, uh, the the comments to the memes. You know, it's like browsing through Amazon stuff and just reading the comments through video games and whatnot uh, or consoles. It's awesome because um, there's like, uh, or yeah, sticking with the pictures, there's a picture or a picture of an Xbox or an Amazon. It's like the you can buy an Xbox here, and you have this awesome comment section where section where people like. In the end, always get in a fight into each other, like console wars. And on nine gig, it's right now. It's always always this leftist and liberals versus conservatives, which is basically the right wing. And it all is so emotional about a stupid picture. Uh, yeah, it's people who have uh, way too much time on their hands yeah. uh, to actually try to solve real problems. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, um, uh, geez, you're, you're trying we... to bring it back. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how you got there either. I got there from my being, for me, being sarcastic about this entire monopoly stuff. Because in those comments, you so often read stuff like, well, if you're poor, it's basically your fault. And that, um, Ah, this is why I saw um, there was a videotaping from Fox News where they're comparing Denmark with Venezuela, where in Denmark they are basically handing out welfare to everyone, so everyone is too lazy to work. And you read those comments and they're like, yeah, it's right. You shouldn't have any well kind of welfare because if you don't have, if you're in fear of, well, starving to death, you're not working properly and stuff. So, <laughs> oh Jesus! Awesome. Okay, yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I don't even know how to go there right now. But uh, the world is is a dumpster fire, and it's on fire. And uh, yeah, dumpster fire on fire. I'm very eloquent at this point. Okay, so back to the issue at hand: a uh, Harvard study uh, yeah. trying to say that. Uh, it's not doing its job that the ESRB is not doing its job because it didn't warn us of the horrors that are our Pac-Man. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's an attempt, uh, to somehow create a controversy over something that it is growing less and less controversial as fewer and fewer generations did not grow up with games. I think that's really the takeaway from this, that 40 years after gaming went mainstream, or at this point, 20 years after gaming went mainstream, uh, almost everybody who is relevant to the debate, so people 40 years and younger, everybody grew up on games in some fashion, or grew up around games in some fashion. And so the idea of not understanding gaming content is becoming less and less important or less and less relevant. Now, granted, this is also the same month that we're also going to get GTA 3. So all hell is about to break loose again. <laughs> oh, Lord, <yeah. laughs> As it but, did now yeah. when the definitive edition for oh, GTA 3. Yeah, yeah, but not because of the violence. For other reasons. <laughs> because everybody looks weird and wonky. And mm -hmm. I really think it's just because everybody forgot what the real graphics on a PS2 looked like. But uh, yeah. that's another issue entirely. Let's not go yeah. there. And, uh, yeah, I just want just... somebody to uncover that hot coffee is still in the code someplace. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> uh, I hope so. 
I hope so. I would be extreme. It's not a definitive edition unless we get hot coffee back. I say bring back hot coffee. None of this mild, lukewarm coffee. I want the hot coffee. (laughs) You know, this was basically a lukewarm coffee. (laughs) Well, it was lukewarm after they censored it. I want the hot coffee. I want the version that was originally supposed to be in the game. Or yeah. you saw stuff, not just, you know, some noise from outside the cabin. I want, yeah. I want to turn this into a hardcore pornography game because have, have you actually seen I, the I really want mark? people, I want people to get really, really angry again. Dude, I mean, I, I was, what age was I when San Andreas was published? Oh, that would have been, uh, when was that? Ooh, that's uh, what two thousand and seven, two thousand. No, that's somewhere late. About, yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, it was pretty late. Uh, if memory serves me right, wait one second. We can do this. Yeah, I I have to know that. Two thousand four. <laughs> two thousand four. Oh my yeah. goodness. Okay, so I was way too young to handle anything, and I think I think two thousand five, two thousand six, I uh, I got my hands on a copy of GDA, and there was this hot coffee discussion, and you saw some pictures of this hot coffee mod, but I mean, this was lukewarm. I mean, they were basically fully clothed. Even using the mod. And yes, I used... Well, that was using the mod, but that wasn't the way it was originally intended to be. Remember, the mod only unlocked what was left of the assets. But the original intention was to be much, uh, much, uh, to go much further. We uh, just okay. killed it before it came out. <laughs> I mean, why did they kill it? It was, uh, it wasn't because, sure. because, you because can America. get away with violence. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. They did not want to get – you know, the violence was never going to become an issue. No. What was going to become an issue was the sex. Hmm. And so they had to get rid of it. They, <laughs> even they were like, okay, we're we're the biggest thing in the world, but we're not big enough to pull that off just yet. Just yet. And really? that's why the definitive edition needs to come out and fix this problem. Yeah, I, I see mean, the I original think sales would go through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for as long as they could still be on the app store, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> or something. Okay, enough of this. We have one more story to finally put a, yes. a stake mm. in this. So, Call. Yes, because we are staying in the field of, uh, of education and you are working at the university. I myself, I call myself a little well-educated as well. A little well educated. What is the little <laughs> yeah, of course, the okay, your English is collapsing <laughs> at this point. Okay, just get yeah. to the story. Just get to the story. Yeah, uh, gaming gets its first dedicated academic journal, the Swedish Game Studies Journal. Yeah, the Swedish Game Studies Journal is an online academic journal published online three to four times a year to disseminate academic work in and around the rich cultural genre of games. The journal is still being published to this day. I accept that. <laughs> you accept <laughs> this. You are not going to reject this fact. Okay, that is no. good. I think, maybe. So, no, I, uh, yeah. and I think this is a nice, um, except you want to add to that story. Do you want to add to that story? Uh, not much. I mean, I look through it a little bit. And uh, the deal with it is uh, it's basically just a handful of articles with each new update oh. that uh, try to really look at gaming from a, a uh, academic point of view. I didn't get too deep into it. There's a link to it in the show notes, obviously. Uh, but it is kind of cool to see that uh, it's still going, that it's a project that uh, has not – fallen away like so many of these things and it's kind of weird because up until this point i had never even heard about this thing before and it was just one little mention in a magazine just like a little side blurb in the england's pc zone magazine but uh it's one of those cool resources that i do want to delve a little bit deeper into just to see what else they've uh they have in there yeah very cool uh, that uh, somebody thought of this and actually implemented it. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, why not? You can do research on basically anything, and why not on games and game development? So exactly, that's exactly. Really cool. Um, <clears throat> talking about business not being a real science. Anywho, um, yeah. well, here we're yeah. talking culture. So this is uh, societal studies, social studies. So and it's those are not too bad. Very much so. Okay, but that is the end of our time travel, which also means, Peter, what is the word of the day? Education. Education. I love it because that's what I get paid for these days. So uh, remember, everybody, you can uh, sign up at our Patreon and help support us there, pay for the uh, cost of hosting, and uh, also get to watch some exclusive videos and early access to our interviews. And uh, that's uh, that's all I can think of. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners, Peter? No, actually not. I, I just want to say have fun until our next episode. Excellent. In that case, then, everybody, take care. Because you already stole my line, have fun. <laughs>